Hi, I'm Jeanette Roche. This is Bridge City News. Here are some of the top stories we've been following. City Hall raises a flag as Veterans Week officially declared. Plus, a Lethbridge collector owns a piece of history and plans to fly it on Remembrance Day. And MLA Shannon Phillips calls for investigation of who was left in charge of the province during Kenny's August vacation. Your nation. Your province. Your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Jeanette Roche. Thanks for joining us. The newly elected mayor of Lethbridge, Blaine Higgin, was on hand at City Hall Thursday morning along with veterans, LPS, and city councillors of our city to declare Veterans Week from November 4th to the 11th. A poppy flag was also raised today in honor of the veterans who made the ultimate sacrifice. The president of the Lethbridge Legion, Michael McCormickin, says the poppy flag symbolizes the honor and respect for veterans who laid down their lives for our country. Uh, our veterans are the uh, uh, people who uh, were lucky enough uh, to be a, uh, to live after whatever event it was. It uh, um, it gave us our freedom. Like uh, unfortunately, uh, wars had to be fought to maintain freedom. And as we all know, there are many places still in the world today. We hear them on the news every day, every other day. Uh, where war is going on and people's freedoms are negligible. They're, they're, uh, they're almost totally controlled. During the week, 4th Avenue between 9th and 11th Street will be temporarily renamed Veteran Avenue. A Lethbridge man has been collecting and restoring vintage warplanes from the 1940s and 50s. As Micah Quinn explains, he will also be conducting a flyover during a Remembrance Day ceremony in our city this year to give thanks to the veterans who fought for our freedoms. Jeffrey Brain has a passion for vintage airplanes like this beautiful 1952 Harvard. It's a former Royal Canadian Air Force airplane, so it was appropriate to fly it over Remembrance Day. Uh, last year was the first year it came out of restoration, so it was the first time it was available. So His second prize airplane is a Boeing Sherman from 1942 that he's had in his possession for seven years. This airplane was sitting in a barn in, in uh, Tisdale for 25 years, uh, covered in dust and, and bird droppings, and so we Took the wings off a couple years ago, trucked it back to Lethbridge, and uh, with the help of a team, we managed to restore it and bring it back to the way it looked when it was decommissioned in 1966. And so now it's a pleasure just to fly it in the skies of southern Alberta again. Brain says it's meaningful to be able to fly his Harvard on Remembrance Day to honor the veterans who paid the ultimate sacrifice. Last year, I was surprised at how many letters and phone calls I, I received from people in the Lethbridge area. Uh, just saying that their uncle used to fly it or their grandfather used to work on it, and it was meaningful because it was, an, it was an airplane that's iconic that was in the skies in southern Alberta during the war and right through to the, the mid-60s. Brain will be flying his Harvard over top of the Lethbridge Cenotaph on November 11th at 11 a.m., and then he'll make his way to Coaldale and Stirling for their Remembrance Day ceremonies. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Thank you for that, Micah. Lethbridge West MLA Shannon Phillips wants to see action now. Phillips has reached out to the province's Auditor General to investigate who was left in charge of the province while Premier Jason Kenney was on vacation in August. Phillips is also asking for more information as to the UCP's processes in handing over executive authority from Kenney to an acting Premier. The issue over who was in charge first came to light during the fourth wave in August when our province's health care system was being strained by increased COVID-19 cases. Theoretically speaking, the Minister of Finance, or Travis Taves, is second in command, following, uh, followed by the Minister of Energy, which would be Sonia Savage. Meanwhile, a backbench member of the United Conservative government is calling for a public inquiry into what he calls the harms caused by Alberta's COVID-19 restrictions on children and young adults. Jason Stephen, the member for Red Deer South, made the statement in the Alberta legislature this week. Stephen says young Albertans are not overwhelming the health care system. He says Alberta Health Services is well funded and should have more ICU beds. Alberta Health Services says it has been successful in increasing hospital and ICU capacity throughout the pandemic.
Alberta is expanding its booster shot eligibility on Monday to include frontline health care workers. The province also says Albertans aged 70 and older and First Nations, Métis and Inuit people 18 and older can get their third shot of COVID-19 vaccines. Premier Jason Kenney says nearly 40,000 residents in care facilities and more than 180,000 immunocompromised Albertans have received their booster shot in recent weeks. Alberta reported 487 new COVID cases yesterday and 14 more deaths. Active cases decreased to 6,693, while there are three, uh, 697 patients in hospital with COVID, including 155 in intensive care. Lethbridge County's Chief Administration Officer has been recognized with a national award. And Mitchell was awarded the Women of Influence and in Local Government Award from Municipal World Magazine. The publication is focusing on celebrating women in local government in 2021, with Mitchell being the latest recipient. She says even though she is passionate about local government, she was still surprised when she found out that she was being recognized. This is a job that it, it's not filled with accolades. You do it for the love of local government. You do it to make your communities run better, run smoother. And so uh, people, CAO, city managers, we're not in it for the glory. We're in it for how can we make our communities better. And we get really excited by innovative ways to make, our, make ourselves sustainable. Mitchell has been CAO of Lethbridge County since 2018. She had previously worked as a CAO in three Ontario municipalities. Shoppers can expect to pay more for dairy products in the new year as the Canadian Dairy Commission recommends a large hike in milk prices. Dairy producer and board chair for Alberta Milk, Stuart Bouvy, explains what is driving up the costs. Our input at costs have gone up. They went up last year as well, and we had a small increase, but this year we're basically paying catch-up. You know, for example, our hay price has doubled. So, and you can well imagine when you have a herd of cows how much hay they eat, uh, and other costs, fuel, you know, and some of it is COVID-related. Our costs have gone, gone up, so it's not like um, we're making extra money. We're playing catch-up on, on our cost recovery. The Federal Crown Corporation says the price increase is expected to be approved by provincial authorities next month and would, would take effect February the 1st. Well, this is a time when post-secondary students are facing multiple stressors, including midterm exams and assignments coming due. In this next story, Naveen Day shares with us how University of Lethbridge students are getting hugs from home. Parents of students living in residence at the University of Lethbridge were invited to order Hugs from Home packages online from the bookstore. They are small care packages containing treats, snacks, and other gifts. It is a joint initiative between the university's bookstore and housing services. Residence Life and Education Coordinator for the University, Laura Corral, says the packages are a great way to help parents ensure their children are thriving mentally during their time on campus. It's just a nice way of a parent being like, hey, like I'm here for you, I'm giving you your space, you're doing amazing with a really stressful time because it is midterm season when these hugs from homes come around. Um, so we partner with the bookstore to make sure that, you know, parents are there to support their kid through a really stressful time. When we're not in a term, we like to have fun things for students to purchase, our community members, books to help them relax some stress balls, and when Housing was doing the hugs from home previous to us being involved, they were doing mugs of soup and things like that, which were really good, and then it grew so big that they needed a partner. So of course, the bookstore is the best place to go for partnership. Parents can choose from two unique packages, one which contained a mug, hot chocolate, and chocolate bars, and another that included treats like cookies and popcorn. They could also add other items to customize the gifts for their students. Medina Ali, a fourth-year student from Calgary, says her heart just warmed when she was notified her parents had sent her a package. It's really nice to have my parents only like two, three hours away because I can come back when I need and I know that I have the support who's there. But it, it's still like I'm on my own and I'm kind of like growing into becoming my own independent person. And so when I get like that hug from home, it's just a really good reminder that my family's still there supporting me even though they're not, I'm not living with them right now. Some parents have even purchased extra gifts to donate to students in need. Over 120 Hugs From Home packages have been purchased this year. For Bridge City News, 
I'm Naveen Day. Thank you, Naveen. And speaking of gifts, it's hard to believe that we need to start thinking about Christmas already, particularly if you're interested in taking part in Operation Christmas Child, that wonderful campaign where you send a shoebox of gifts to children in developing countries. Well, Samaritan's Purse has made things even easier by implementing an online pack-a-box option. We have an online shoebox option called packabox.ca where you can pack shoe boxes online. And I'm just thrilled to tell you that last year, the number of, of shoe boxes packed online tripled from the year before. So that's just a, just a, we just gave a big cheer for that to see that despite the pandemic, Canadians still wanna help children uh, in these developing countries. And when they get an opportunity to do it by doing Shoe boxes online at packabox.ca. They're actually doing it, and we say thank you so much for them. You can catch my full interview with Frank King of Operation Christmas Child coming up in the second half of the show. The Better Business Bureau of Southern Alberta is warning consumers about a recent spike in complaints for furnace and duct cleaning. These are issues surrounding warranty, billing concerns, and shoddy work. The media and communication specialist for the BBB, Wes LaFortune, says he has some tips for you to look out for if you're going to be hiring these companies. You know, what we always say is do in-depth research. And one of the best ways to get that research is through BBB.org. That's the Better Business Bureau website. And you'll find uh, thousands of business profiles listed there. And uh, they're all vetted. And if they're an accredited business, they've gone through an accreditation process, which means they meet eight standards set out by the BBB. So that also gives you uh, some extra assurance that you're hiring uh, a reputable company. LaFortune also says to find out about WCB coverage, liability insurance, and criminal background checks of a company. Lethbridge police made a bust at a Southside hotel early Thursday morning. The Lethbridge police tactical team, along with Alert, arrested a man and a woman following a drug search at the Super Lodge Hotel on 7th Avenue South. The LPS says no further information is available right now and an update will be provided as soon as possible. A 29-year-old Calgary man appeared in court today after being charged in the death of his mother. Police say a woman's body was found in a home on a Saturday. The victim has been identified as 50-year-old Deborah Ann Mitchell. An autopsy has been performed, but the cause of her death has not been released. Her son, Levi Romeo Mitchell, has been charged with second-degree murder. Calgary police have charged a 15-year-old boy following a stabbing at a city high school. Police say just before noon yesterday, officers responded to a stabbing at Bishop McNally High School and found an injured 17-year-old boy. He was taken to hospital in stable, non-life-threatening condition. The school was temporarily placed into lockdown, and police say they later made an arrest and charged a youth with assault with a weapon. During difficult times like these, it's important to receive as much support as possible. Penny Pittman is a family support worker for the Family and Community Support Services in the Warner, Milk River, and Coots area. Pittman explains the impact groups like hers have on so many of our, of our communities. These are groups that include anyone who cares for children in any capacity. A grandparent, guardian, foster families, um, step families, yeah, biological parents. And it's just a space, a safe space for them to get together and talk about, you know, sort of the joys and the challenges of caring for, for children. Watch the full interview with Penny Pittman from Family and Community Support Services coming up later in our broadcast. BC Premier John Horgan has confirmed that a growth in his throat is malignant. But he also says his prognosis is good and he expects to make a full recovery after radiation therapy. That will start in about two weeks and last through next month. A biopsy was performed last week after the growth was located when Horgan reported a lump in his neck. Horgan says he will participate virtually in meetings, uh, briefings, cabinet meetings and other important gatherings.
As solar energy becomes more commonplace around the globe, millions of acres are being covered with panels necessary to create electricity. While some worry about the loss of valuable farmland, others see it as an opportunity. We're taking advantage of really, really historic practices and overlaying with it a new benefit of energy production. As water resources become less abundant, we have to find other cool ways of saving water if we're gonna keep producing food. We can do more with the land beneath our panels. We don't have to leave the soils underneath our solar panels across our country uh, denuded or just left to weeds, whereas elevating the panels up a little bit more provides agricultural jobs as well as an opportunity to do more with our land. Pediatricians, offices, and hospitals across the U.S. have begun inoculating children ages 5 through 11. Schools and other locations will soon follow suit. The federal government has promised enough vaccines to protect nearly 28 million children in the United States. I really wanted to go traveling, so I, I, I took the chance. Ready? One, two, three. You did great. So we've been watching the news. We've been itching to get this vaccination for them. So I think um, it's important uh, with, with you know, all the di different uh, strains going around. Take a big breath in, big breath out. Well done. Good job. Good job. At first I was feeling nervous, but I mean, I knew how shots felt. So right then and there, I felt fine. Well, here's a cool story. The northern Indian city of Ayota kept its Guinness World Record for the third year in a row by lighting 900,000 oil lamps. All the lamps had to be kept burning for at least 45 minutes as part of the celebration of Diwali, the Hindu festival of lights. Well, it was another warm day in Lethbridge, and the double-digit temperatures we've been experiencing will stick around for the short term. Anyways, I'll have the complete look at weather forecasts in just a moment. Keep it right here. Welcome back. Well, it turned out to be a pretty decent day here in Lethbridge, especially when the sun shone through those clouds. It was lovely. And never mind double digits, we actually saw temperatures up into the teens. We actually got around 17 degrees today, even though our high was 16, so it was lovely. Uh, we should see those double digits stick around for about another day or so. Uh, overnight low tonight, 4 degrees, um, mainly cloudy skies this evening into tomorrow, Friday. 11 degrees the high, not quite the teens, but we will certainly take it. Mix of sun and cloud tomorrow into Saturday. That's where we're seeing the temperature drop into those single digit values. So 9 degrees the high for Saturday and to Sunday, we're looking at 8 degrees. Six degrees the high for Monday, down to eight on Tuesday, and all the way down to four degrees on Wednesday with a mix of sun and cloud for most of the week. Now, the average high for this time of year is eight degrees, and we will be there shortly. Uh, average low, minus five. In uh, 2000, uh, sorry, in 1949, rather, we had our warmest day on record for this day, which was 22 degrees. And it was a chilly minus 24 back in 2003. Sun rose this morning at 8.25 a.m. And our sun set this evening at 6.04 p.m., giving us right around nine and a half hours of daylight. Okay, it's going to be a windy one tomorrow on the west coast. Victoria actually seeing wind gusts up to 60 to 80 kilometers per hour, especially in the Harrow Strait. Uh, they're looking at showers there as well, 11 degrees, 10 degrees the high in Vancouver with rain and windy conditions as well, up to 60 to 70 kilometers per hour um, wind. 11 degrees the high in Edmonton tomorrow and an even 10 degrees in Calgary with the sun shining. Now over in the rest of the prairies we're seeing sunshine in Saskatoon, 12 degrees the high. Uh, Regina we're going to be seeing uh, some early morning showers clearing by around noon, 14 the high. And then those showers are going to hit Winnipeg later on in the day. Uh, as we move to Toronto, we're seeing sunshine, 9 degrees the high, 7 degrees the high in Ottawa. But Ottawa is seeing a 30% chance of a flurries. Uh, Montreal sitting at 6 degrees tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud. Now, as we look to Atlantic Canada, over on the east coast, Fredericton sitting at 6 degrees with lots of sunshine, mix of sun and cloud in Halifax, 7 degrees the high, 7 the high for Charlottetown with a mix of sun and cloud. Seven, also the high for St. John's tomorrow, uh, sitting with a mix of sun and cloud, but uh, there is a special weather statement in effect for St. John's. We're going to be seeing rain and snow move in by Friday evening. Could expect up to five centimeters of the white stuff. So there you have it. 
That is your forecast. Stats Canada says our country's merchandise trade surplus jumped nearly 27% in September over the previous month to $1.9 billion. The federal agency says total exports fell 2.3% as the shortage of semiconductor chips continued to hurt auto production. Exports of motor vehicles and parts fell 17.9%, while exports of metal and non-metallic mineral products dropped 8.1%. Supply shortages also impacted imports which fell 3% overall as imports of motor vehicles and parts dropped 13.6%. Maple Leaf Foods is reassessing its plant protein investments as its third quarter profit was down by more than 32 percent from a year earlier. The company says its profit dropped from 66 to 44.5 million dollars in the same quarter last year when it saw gains in non-cash fair value changes in biological assets and derivative contracts. Sales totaled 1.18 billion dollars that's actually up from $1.06 billion a year earlier, but plant protein sales fell nearly 7% to $48 million. Company officials say the slowdown in the plant-based protein category performance may suggest systemic changes in the high growth rates expected by the industry. Now here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 77 points on the day to finish at 21,342. The Dow was down 33 points to 36,124. The S&P 500 was up 19 points to 4,680. The Nasdaq was up 128 points to 15,940. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 205 to 7881 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 5 cents to 572 US. Gold was down 10 cents to 1791.95 US an ounce. Silver was even on the day at 2379 US an ounce. Wheat is at $11.84 per bushel, barley is at $9.47, canola is at $22.15, and corn is at $10.06 per bushel. Live cattle were down $1.03 to $130.63. Feeder cattle were down $1.15 to $158.03. Lean hogs were up $1.93 to $77.88. And the Canadian dollar was even over the past 24 hours to $80.26 US. Recapping one of our top stories today, Lethbridge West MLA Shannon Phillips has reached out to the province's Auditor General to investigate who was left in charge of the province while Premier Jason Kenney was on vacation back in August when the province hit its fourth wave of COVID. Phillips is also asking for more information as to the UCP's processes in handing over executive authority from Kenney to an acting Premier. Well, there's a special way you can help underprivileged children around the world this holiday season. Frank King with Operation Christmas Child will have details in just a moment. Well, most of you know about Operation Christmas Child, also known as the Shoebox Campaign, which is a project of the international relief organization Samaritan's Purse. It's become the world's largest children's Christmas project, and joining me from Calgary to talk about this is Frank King. He's the news media relations manager with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Welcome to the show, Frank. So great to have you back on again already. Christmas time, we are already talking Christmas. I can't believe it. It is it is crazy how fast things are going, but I appreciate you folks having me on board to, today. Of course. So for any viewers, Frank, who may be unfamiliar with this, what is Operation Christmas Child all about? Operation Christmas Child is all about generous Canadians packing shoeboxes full of toys, school supplies, and hygiene items, and then dropping them off at uh, one of hundreds of drop-off locations across Canada, from there, all those shoe boxes are shipped to our, our warehouse in Calgary, where thousands of generous volunteers uh, go through every box, make sure that there's nothing inside any of them that could scare or harm a child or stop the boxes from getting through customs. And from there, they're packed in crates and then they're shipped down to uh, countries in Central America and uh, West Africa, where we have uh, partners in those countries that set up these wonderful distribution events and invite all the children to come. And then they come and then they uh, receive these incredible boxes. And I have to tell you, you know, for a lot of these children, these shoe boxes full of uh, you know, toys, school supplies and hygiene items 
are the first gift they will have ever received in their lives. So that tells you about the impact that these shoeboxes can, can have in the lives of these children. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Now, how many kids in how many different countries have you reached? And what are some of the different countries? <clears throat> well, I can tell you that uh, uh, since 1993, more than 187 million children have received shoeboxes from generous folks in Canada, the United States, the UK, Australia. Uh, there's a couple of other countries there too. I can't, can't remember them all, but uh, yeah. And uh, in terms of Canadian shoe boxes, uh, they go to countries in uh, uh, Central America, such as Nicaragua, El Salvador, Costa Rica. They also go to uh, French speaking West Africa. So we're speaking about uh, Senegal, the Gambia, and a couple of other countries around there. And of course, your listeners and your viewers can get all the information they need uh, about you know where shoe boxes are going and all that sort of thing at SamaritansPurse.ca. Okay, good to know. So 187 million kids you're saying have been reached. So what are the age groups of these kids who are receiving these gifts? Well, when uh, when folks pack their their shoe boxes, they they have a choice of a three, obviously a choice of boy or girl, but of course they also have a choice of age groups. That's two to four, five to nine, and ten to fourteen. And then if you go onto SamaritansPurse.ca, there's all kinds of suggestions about here's the really good stuff for for each of those age ranges and genders, and here's also a list of stuff that you really shouldn't be putting to shoe boxes as well. So we try to cover all the bases when folks are considering uh, packing their boxes. That's a really good idea because I think that uh, it, especially it's easier to pack for the younger kids. It's maybe a little bit more challenging for like a 14 year old, 13 year old. So that's great. If you guys have suggestions on your website, I think that that is perfect. <laughs> so we're so glad that you mentioned that. So how do the kids and the families react to the gifts that they're getting? Can you maybe share a story of what kind of impact this makes? Yeah, you, you'd be surprised at sort of the, the range that uh, the kids have. Like some of the kids are really excited and they're opening their boxes and they're showing the kids beside them and, you know, they're showing them. Maybe they're trading stuff, which we're fine with. Other kids will take it, they'll open them up, they'll carefully look through and then they'll close the box again and they won't open it again until they get home so they can show their siblings and their parents. So it's really neat to see the range of reactions you can get at these shoebox distribution events. That's so cute and so sweet too. Now, does the shoebox also have an impact on the surrounding community? Does it open doors to bring about like positive changes? It absolutely does. Really glad you asked that because what, what often happens is uh, we start distributing shoe, shoe boxes in an area and then the community leaders will come to us and say, you know, thank you so much for doing this. Can you help us with this or with water or with education or with literacy or with, you know, uh, some of our agricultural issues? And so that opens the door for Samaritans first to go in there and do all kinds of other stuff. And again, always do it in the name of Jesus. And, and when folks ask us, you know, why we're doing this, we always tell them it's because of Jesus and because we follow him and he tells us do good to everyone. And this is why we do that. And so, yeah, it's, it's a great door opener to do a lot of other really great stuff. Mm -hmm. That must leave quite an impression on these uh, precious kids too. Now, obviously we've had this huge pandemic and this super virus. So how has COVID affected the way that you're doing uh, the shoebox campaign? Well, it's definitely had a, a lot of effect on us as it has on pretty much everybody. You know, the constant pivoting this way and that way, depending on you know what government things are happening or depending on where the pandemic is, has really affected in terms of what we can do and you know, how we can do it. So for example, we often have a lot of staff traveling to countries like this to check with our partners. How are things going? How can we make things better? Well, we pretty much, that's been pretty much gone now since the pandemic started, for example. Um, the other issue has been sort of getting volunteers to come in and, and inspect all the shoe boxes. So we've had to do some very careful stuff with that in terms of uh, making sure everybody's masked, making sure, uh, you know, testing or vaccinations, all that sort of thing. So we've done a ton of that kind of stuff. The other thing where it's had an impact is uh, last year with people's concerns about touching things and shopping and, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, the number of shoeboxes packed in the traditional way was actually down last year. But interestingly, we have an online shoebox option called packabox.ca, where you can pack shoeboxes online. 
And I'm just thrilled to tell you that last year, the number of, of shoe boxes packed online tripled from the year before. So that's just a, just a, we just gave a big cheer for that to see that despite the pandemic, Canadians still want to help children uh, in these developing countries. And when they get an opportunity to do it by doing shoe boxes online at packabox.ca, they're actually doing it. And we say thank you so much for them. And again, packabox.ca is open this year again. In fact, it's open 24 seven year round. So it could be the middle of an August heat wave, but boy, if God's put it on your heart to pack shoe boxes, you can go and do it in the middle of an August heat wave at packabox.ca. That's cool. Okay, so maybe explain how it works then, this packing boxes online through packabox.ca. We try as much as possible to echo the traditional shoebox packing experience. So we still have the same, you know, picking your gender, your age range, and then we, we created a basic basket of items uh, for, for each of those age ranges and genders. And you can add on to that if you want. And then what happens is uh, you check out, you make your payment, and boom, what happens then is uh, usually fairly early in the new year, we'll gather together thousands of volunteers again at our Cal old Calgary warehouse. And what they will do is they will physically pack the boxes that folks have done online. And I should tell you this too, here's another way we try to echo the traditional shoebox packing experience. One of the things we ask people to do is uh, put in a note or a photo with every shoebox you pack so that these kids can see, you know, who are these people who have done this amazing thing for me? Well, when you go to packabox.ca and do it online, you've got an option to upload a note and a photo for each shoebox you pack. And then when our volunteers are physically packing them, they download those notes and photos and they put them in the appropriate shoeboxes. So again, echoing the traditional shoebox experience as much as possible because we know how much pleasure that gives so many parents and kids. Yeah, totally. So it's all done digitally and then you just have a volunteer that's physically putting the box together. So you just click on items that you want to purchase and, and that's how it's done basically. Yes, yeah, it's it, in some ways it's like shopping at Amazon. You have you've got a <laughs> yeah. shopping cart and you put stuff in it and when you're done, you check out and you pay and boom, you're on your way. In fact, that's how my wife and I do it. We find, we find the best, especially as, um, you know, you touched on earlier that, that the older age boys, especially, it's difficult to figure out what to put in the shoe boxes. Yeah. When you do it online, all that is laid out for you. So when my wife and I do it, we always do it online and we always pick the older age boys because boom, there, we don't have to figure out what to put in. It's all set up and arranged. We just do it all online and we make sure that the group that gets the least number of boxes, those are the ones we can pay attention to when we pack our boxes online. Yeah, what a great idea. I absolutely love it. And it's kind of one of those in your face virus, right? <laughs> We're gonna get around this. So I love that. Now, National Collection Week for 2021 is coming up, right? So viewers have until Sunday, November the 21st to drop off their shoe boxes. So what, you know, we were talking a lot about what we should put into the shoe box and um, you have all those suggestions online. So where, if you are gonna do one physically and not online, where can people drop these off? That's a great question. When they go to samaritanspurse.ca and you click on any of the stories that are on Operation Christmas Child, and most of them are right now, that'll take you straight to the Operation Christmas Child landing page. You go under the pack a box uh, link at the top. And one of the things is drop-off centers. That pops open. All you need to have is your postal code. You put your postal code in and it will give you all the shoebox location, the drop-off locations within, well, actually as much as 200 kilometers if you want to go that wide uh, in terms of where are they. And also uh, you can click on those then and they tell you the exact name of the place, the address, and even the hours of operation. That's the best thing of all. So if you're going to make a drive to drop off your shoeboxes, you can make sure you're there when they're open and can accept your shoeboxes. So again, SamaritansPurse.ca. And if you want to go straight to the Operation Christmas Child uh, uh, pages, just go SamaritansPurse.ca slash OCC. And that'll take you right to the Operation Christmas Child landing page. Okay, great. So we're also to include a, a $10 donation, I understand, to cover the cost to get the shoebox to the children, right? So it's basically a shipping a shipping cost then? 
Yeah, we, we request that. Uh, by no means is it is it demanded. So if folks put in their shoe boxes without the $10 stuff, we're still going to get it to those chill, children who need it. That ten dollars stuff does cost cover the various administrative costs and, of course, the transportation costs. And we've had people in the past say, "Gee, that you know, it seems a little expensive." My response is, "Try shipping a shoebox full of stuff across Canada yeah. for ten dollars." You know, yeah. and good luck. <laughs> it's just it's just not going to happen. So to get a shoebox all the way from Canada to say Senegal, way over in West Africa, for ten dollars. That's a pretty good deal. And so that's the thing I try to help yeah. people sort of get their heads around. And once they realize that, they're like, makes sense. Yeah. Let's get her it done. It does make sense. But if you're unable to make that donation for whatever reason, will the shoebox still get there if, if we forget to include that $10? Absolutely, yeah. And you can either put it in your shoeboxes or you can actually make the donation right straight online. So you've got that choice. Again, as always, SamaritansPurse.ca. Mm -hmm. And yeah, nice and easy. So I, I'm curious, since we're talking about like the $10 donation, uh, how much money do people generally spend on a, on a shoebox? How much are these items that, that you're expected to put in? What's, what's kind of the expected amount? It can depend. Um, we've got a lot of folks who shop year round, a lot of real sort of uh, uh, diehard uh, uh, Operation Christmas Child supporters. And boy, we love every one of them. They're just wonderful. And they will shop year round. They'll look for sales. They'll, they'll actually email and, and Facebook and stuff to other folks to say, hey, there's a sale on here at Costco. There's a sale on there at Walmart. There's a, you know, a sale at Canadian Tire. There's whatever. And so folks can sort of do that shopping year round to really reduce their costs for each shoebox they pack. I know we've uh, generally done a, a, a sort of an overall look at it because basically because Canada Revenue Agency wants to know. And it's generally about, about $47 is the amount of value that, that uh, we've sort of ascertained that people have spent in general on average for shoebox. So you can spend way less or you can spend way more. That just seems to be sort of the middle ground of where the majority of folks are spending. So that that's so if you're wondering how much, that sounds like a good one to go with. Okay, that's that's really good to know. Now, how do you decide which child gets a, a box? I mean, the sad reality is there's so many needy kids out there and there's far more of them than there are shoeboxes. So how does that work? That's where we rely on our partners in the receiving countries. So they're the ones who get the boxes through customs. They're the ones who work with other volunteers around the country to actually set up a distribution events, almost always through churches. And then they invite the children to come so that uh, how, whatever age range and gender and all that and number of children who are invited, those are the boxes they make sure they have at that distribution event so that you know nobody goes away not getting one or not getting one for a boy or a girl. So it takes a fair bit of coordination. So we're really blessed to have very committed volunteers and they're in our receiving countries because you know as much as we can do here in Canada, if we don't have someone down there to do it as well, it's really not going to go well. So we're yeah. very blessed to have those kind of volunteers in those countries who love Operation Christmas Child. They love how it gives the children they see every day the kind of hope that perhaps they wouldn't have before they have got, gotten that uh, shoe, shoe box. Right. Excellent. Now, uh, obviously, time is running out. National Collection Week is uh, coming up on Sunday, November 21st for 2021. Uh, just as a side note, people in Lethbridge can drop off their boxes at Park Meadows Baptist Church. And if you're in other cities, you go to the website as well that you mentioned before. What is it again? Uh, the website is a samaritansfirst.ca. And if you want to go straight to the Operation Christmas Child pages, just add a slash OCC at the end. And I'll take you right to the Operation Christmas Child pages. Perfect. Thanks so much, Frank. We really appreciate having you on today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the generous folks uh, out there who are giving children hope giving children a chance to get, get a gift for maybe the first time in their lives and to find out that people in Canada care about them and God cares about them too. So we're, thank you so much. Awesome. Frank King is the News Media Relations Manager with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Being 
being a parent is a challenging task for any of us, and it can get a lot tougher when you have blended families or special needs children. Joining us to discuss the support that is available to parents and caregivers is Penny Pittman. She's a family support worker with family and community support. She joins us from Warner, Alberta. Welcome, Penny. Thank you. Nice to be here. Now, Penny, I believe that you are overseeing something called Caregiver Cafe Groups. That's in uh, the Warner, Milk River, and Coots areas. It's a cute little name. So can you maybe give us a little snapshot of who these groups are for and what's it all about? Sure. So um, we took the parent cafe and um, sort of renamed it to a Caregiver Cafe. And these are groups that include anyone who cares for children in any capacity, so grandparents, guardians, foster families, um, step families, yeah, biological parents. And it's just a space, a safe space for them to get together and talk about, you know, sort of the joys and the challenges of caring for, for children and teens too. So it's basically from zero to 18 years of age. Yeah, okay, so that's awesome. Now, are these groups meeting in person or online or a little bit of both? I know COVID probably had affected it a little bit. Yeah, so we unfortunately had just launched our first series just before uh, the, the shutdowns in March. So we moved it to an online platform and um, all of my groups so far have been on, on, on Zoom, and which has its challenges, but it also offers some benefits um, so parents uh, don't have to leave the house or find childcare. Yeah, so, I, actually, I actually could see a strong yeah. benefit for mm -hmm. it being done over Zoom. You might actually even get a few more people. So that's awesome. So the idea behind this is to help build and maintain strong and healthy families, right? So how would you define that? What kind of traits does a healthy and strong family usually exhibit? So resilience um, is probably one of the main ones. Um, good uh, connection, good relationships within the family, um, communication, um, and really importantly, um, understanding and accessing support when they need it. Okay, yeah, that sounds awesome. Now, I understand that the concept of this caregiver cafe is based around five protective factors, right? So the first one being parental resilience. Can you maybe explain what this means? Does it just have something to do with overcoming the tendency to get overwhelmed and just kind of give up? Yeah, so resiliency is kind of like bouncing back. So I think about like a ball. And in addition to the bouncing back factor, it's the ability to be able to take some kind of lesson or learning and growth from that stressful experience. So it's, it's a combination of those two things that, that build resilience. Right, and I can see how being a group setting could actually really help. You can hear other struggles and see how they've been able to overcome it too. So it sounds really interesting. So uh, I understand the second productive factor is relationships and social connections. So can you maybe unpack that for us? What does that look like? So that's about, you know, building healthy relationships. So understanding what that actually means, understanding um, what might not be a healthy relationship. Um, and also then teaching that to your children and the people that you're caring for. You know, what does that look like? Modeling, you know, boundaries and um, what to do when you might be in a situation that isn't healthy for you. And um, yeah, because it's, not everyone under even understands what a healthy relationship looks like and being able to bring that out in a safe place and talk about you know what you deserve as a human being and understanding that you have worth and value and um, having people around you that can help you remember that yeah definitely and I I understand there's um, a third protective factor, which is knowledge of parenting and child development. So what kinds of parental knowledge do you try to share with the groups? Okay. So we talk about um, lots about ages and stages. Um, 
positive parenting strategies or times when, um, you know, behavior might not be what you want it to be, how you can deal with that. Um, lots of stuff about um, brain development and, um, yeah, really understanding the capacity of your child at any given time. That's interesting. So uh, what about child development? Is this about brain, brain development, like you said, or is it more like emotional development or is it a little bit of combination? So it's sort of everything. So knowing sort of what's typical. So we use a questionnaire called the ages and stages questionnaire if we think it's needed to see how children, you know, what's typical for development and what can they or can't they do. So that can encompass like motor skills, speech, social, emotional intelligence, things like that. And then we talk about, you know, the developing brain, because when a parent can understand that the child just isn't actually capable of doing something, their brain just has not developed enough, it helps that parent step back and be a little more compassionate and sort of rely on the more positive um, parenting practices. Um, yeah. Now, it sounds like uh, this is for caregivers of, of quite young children. I, am I gathering that right? Or is this for any age group? And do you put them in different different categories in terms of if you're a caregiver of a teen versus a, a three-year-old? How does that work exactly? Well, the interesting thing is that teens go through a brain development period that's very similar to um, you know, the zero to three, the toddlerhood, right? So you've probably heard the term three-nager, right? And that's kind <laughs> well, of that it idea. It makes sense, of... doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the concept is their brains are rapidly changing. So in the adolescent period, it's not as rapid, but they're going through all kinds of things. So typically we would split them up. There is a set of cards and a box for teens, parents of teens or caregivers of teens. However, when you start talking with parents, a lot of what they're talking about, those core principles, apply, I think, to humankind, um, but for sure, all the way through. Yeah. Uh, so what, what, at what age group does it cut off? Uh, we're talking teens, or can we even be talking about, like, young adult children as well, like, in, into their, I guess, late teens, early 20s? Yeah. Our mandate is 0 to 18. So we, we typically serve families in that age range. And um, we have been breaking the cafes up into, so, you know, zero to, you know, 10 and then 12 to 18. Um, so that's typically what we're doing right now. Yeah, just because as far as practical strategies go, those are going to look different. Right, definitely. Based on the age of your child, and, obviously. And, yeah. and how many parents or caregivers are in each group, roughly? Well, um, up to 10 in, in person, uh, cause in an hour, you really want to give everybody an opportunity to, um, either break into smaller groups, um, or to come together as a group and really let everyone have a chance to talk online. I've kind of found that five is a good number to allow that same sort of openness and, um, yeah, a little bit more manageable come forth. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and plus, yeah. if it's a smaller group, some parents or caregivers might be more apt to want to share than if it's a much larger group. And oftentimes there's certain people that are more dominant with talking and others tend to, to keep back a little bit more. So, yes, definitely. So as parents and caregivers, we need to become more aware of where the child is at, obviously, and to adjust our parenting styles accordingly. So what does that look like? It's easier said than done, for sure. <laughs> right. So here's a quick example. Um, just when you're wanting a child who's under three to take turns with a toy or share or the part of their brain, the frontal part of their brain, which doesn't fully develop until, you know, they're like 25 years old, doesn't have the capacity really to uh, monitor their impulse control and their emotions properly. So if you're expecting that to happen on a regular basis without any big feelings about it, 
then that to me would not be a realistic expectation. So that would be a place you could support a parent in, okay, well, if this is what they're capable of, what would that look like for you? How could you have an expectation that was realistic? Um, and not that we aren't encouraging them and modeling and showing them because that's what's growing those skills. We're just not expecting that. They're going to willingly and happily share. Yeah. Now, uh, when you observe those families that have that opportunity to meet together with others going through those same things that they're going through, compared to people who don't, how much difference does that make in parenting or just going through life, really? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I can just speak to what I see and what I hear. And what I hear is parenting, especially small children, can be isolating and with you know the world and the health situation has it's been even more so and that having a space to talk about things where you aren't worried about being judged um, is it just helps draw out those things that they're already doing well because my job as a facilitator is to listen and help them see where they're already strong so that we can draw on those strengths to just keep increasing their confidence because more confident parents parent parent better i mean we all do better when we feel better right so that's what i notice i notice an increase in confidence and sort of a a little bit more um, compassion to themselves and more understanding of their children Wow, that's amazing. And what kind of feedback are you getting from parents and caregivers about this program? So we're getting a lot of feedback about feeling connected, um, feeling supported, uh, knowing where resources are, where they can be connected to those resources, um, not feeling judged, um, and meeting people. And this is one of the other really kind of fun things about Zoom is I recently had some parents, two moms connect from sort of the south end of the province and then up by, you know, Colhurst area. And um, they've maintained that relationship. So it doesn't even have to be in your own community. Um, so they've built a bond that never probably would have happened because we were able to be online. So things like that. Um, and yeah. I was going to ask you, actually, um, being that you can do these online, can it reach people beyond the Warner, Coots, Milk River area? Have you opened it up or are you kind of st sticking strictly to those geographical areas? No. So during the, the pandemic, uh, FCSS has really tried to maintain a presence and online was our only opportunity. So what's been happening is, like I said, we're getting participants. So every co um, support worker in every of our, all of our municipalities might not be running the caregiver cafe, but maybe I'm running one and participants from those other municipalities can join. Um, so that's good. I'm really yeah. glad that I'm glad that yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah, absolutely. And I understand too that FCSS also has caregiver cafe groups specifically designed for Indigenous families. So uh, maybe explain a little bit, just really quickly, what is different with these groups? Is it more the, the cultural background that's, that's included? Well, uh, so Jessica goodrider Lowen is um, our family support worker and a liaison, Indigenous liaison worker in Tabor. And her idea is to um, bring Indigenous families together to create that support network so that they're aware that there are other families with their same cultural background in Tabor and also to um, yeah show up in a way that feels authentic for them and you know we're all trained you know to uh, be culturally sensitive in our programming um, however some of our staff have knowledge um, that can really um, benefit those Indigenous cultures. That's awesome. So how would any interested parents or caregivers get signed up for this program? What do they have to do? So go to the website, um, 
all of the uh, information is listed there, the different areas, the different times, and all of the registration information is there. Uh, you can either go and look at the program or you can just look for the family support worker in your municipality and they will be able to get you hooked up with any programming that's running, even if it's not. So someone could in Raymond could call the Raymond FCSS and they could direct them to me. Great. And that's fcss.ca is the website for family and community support services. Thanks so much for your time today, Penny. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Um, I hope to see uh, more families. Absolutely. Penny Pittman is a family support worker with the Family and Community Support Services. You can look them up at fcss.ca. I'm Jeanette Rocher. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.